quite loud. Morning. Good morning and bula. bula. Let's try that again. Bula. bula. Do you know what bula means? Oh, that's great. <laughs> so mbula is uh, literally how we greet people in Fiji or in the Fijian language. Um, it's probably the first word that you're gonna hear when you enter Fiji or at the airport. Everyone will greet you with a big bula. So I'm gonna, another I and mean, probably an alternative meaning to mbula is also life. Uh, and I understand that uh, some of us might have had a late night last night. So I want you to look at your neighbor. If they're looking a bit uh, dull this morning, I want you to turn, turn to them and say, Mbula. Mbula, eh? Bring them some life, eh? We want some life in this room, eh? Uh, particularly the table at the back there. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, my name is Orisi. Uh, I hail from Fiji, uh, the beautiful island of Taveyuni. Uh, my colleagues will uh, argue that uh, it's not that beautiful, but if you haven't been to Taviuni, then you haven't been to Fiji. Uh, and I invite you, you, if you're in Fiji, please visit the island of Taviuni. So my name is Orisi. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to uh, just humbly appreciate, you know, the Force Koji Committee uh, for this opportunity. I've learned quite a lot in the last few days, uh, last two, three days, sitting you know, amongst a group of experts, those that are quite passionate you know, about open source uh, software, particularly in the area of geospatial. Um, you know, I, I go heading back you know, after this conference, you know, I'm definitely gonna talk a lot about this to a lot of my colleagues. Uh, and so I'm definitely blessed just to, you know, as a kickstart, a uh, huge thanks to the committee that's here. We'll start. Oh, is it a, okay. So my talk today um, is literally on the awareness and application of some of the tools that were used through the Picrophy project. As um, mentioned by Hamish, it's a mouthful when you're saying the entire abbreviation, but what Picrophy literally stands for is Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment Financing Initiative. So from today onwards, we'll just refer to it as Picrophy. Eh? It's tiring saying that whole mouthful. We might be wondering, a lot of us might be wondering what does, you know, what is Picrophy 2 literally about? And so before I go on to that, I'd like to touch on a bit about phase one. Uh, and phase one was established in 2009. Uh, and it was literally um, a project or program that was to develop, you know, disaster risk assessment tools uh, and practical, technical and financial applications to reduce and mitigate um, the impact of natural hazard in the Pacific Island countries. Um, the first phase laid the technical foundation for what we did in the second phase of Picrophy, uh, and that was through the development of, uh, some of you might have heard the Pacific Risk uh, Information System. Um, and this, you know, within this uh, centralized depository, you know, it held um, countries, risk profiles, and also one of the largest collection of georeferenced data in the region in terms of disaster risk information. Um, there was quite a bit of data that was collected through the first phase of uh, Picrophy 1, uh, and also one of the, um, I think one of the key takeaways from Picrophy 1 was the need for a standardized data collection template, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the region. So in summary, um, what Picrophy 2 is about, you know, the, the whole objective was to, or is, to improve and update the Pacific Risk Information System and also, I think more importantly, strengthening um, PIC's capacity for disaster risk management and also an aspect of disaster risk finance as well. Um, the outcomes, we are very hopeful, you know, through Picrophy 2 that we'll be able to, and countries will be able to conduct their own data collection in a more organized or more standardized manner eh, uh, as we are going into the country. And also, um, obviously, you know, as mentioned through some of the talks throughout this week, you know, data is only as useful as how you analyze it and use it to inform some of the decisions, more likely in a disaster risk um, context. And so that was one of our main objectives was for countries to be able to analyze and use this data as well. I'm gonna be talking mostly uh, in terms of Picrophy 2. Uh, the talk this morning is gonna be more on the one of the main components which was on uh, the exposure data collection that was carried out. Uh, and these were the main assets that we, that we focused on, we went out to collect. 
uh, and there were in three main categories, infrastructure, utilities, and agriculture. And so these were the main assets that we focused on and also the assets that we created data collection templates on. And obviously we pulled and we learned from other sources. I'll talk a bit about our approach. Uh, and as, as you might have heard from Harry, you know, a few of the presentations that touched on work that was done with Pacific Island countries or close to the community, one of the key things about it was stakeholder engagement, you know, setting the platform before you actually go into the country. And when you're going to Pacific Island countries, this is very important because it lays the foundation, it strengthens the relationship, which is very important in Pacific Island countries. And so this was an important aspect of the PQP project where we went in, we tried to develop relationships, you know, we had inception meetings, think tank meetings, uh, and um, it, this I, I believe is, you know, other than the implementation of the project in the country, is the actual, you know, the gist of, you know, it really lays the foundation. And a lot of, I'm sure a lot of you that have worked in Pacific Island countries can agree that, you know, this really is uh, what lays the foundation. Next, you know, when we started off, we had to know what tools were being used on the ground, you know. It's not that we walk in and, hey, you guys should use this, you know. This is great, you know, this is it's free, what not, what not. You have to know what's already being used on the ground. In the Pacific Island countries, you'll be surprised with, you know, the number of tools that are being used in some of these ministries. Uh, and I believe there must be a sensitivity to it as well. And lastly, you know, there had to be uh, development and also an agreement on the standardized data collection template. Um, sitting here is Carol, who was involved in much of this uh, aspect of the project, um, she'd know much more about it, uh, and also Lani as well, who was involved in PQP1, part of PQP2 as well. Um, and so what we, we did was we had a few think tank meetings, and you can see standing beautifully in front is Carol as well, who was leading most of the discussions, um, but we had to bring in, dealing with those different assets, we had to bring in experts, you know, that actually knew, you know, what type of data they wanted. Uh, whether it be a background of engineering, uh, utilities, water, electricity, uh, whatnot. So we brought in representatives from over six or seven countries that had knowledge or, uh, you know, or had knowledge on the data that was being collected or what they wanted in a standardized data collection platform in terms of collecting conditions for assets. Uh, and so this is one of the th first think tank meetings where a standardized data collec collection template was drafted and then we had another think tank meeting uh, where it was actually um, finally decided on you know, what we were gonna go through. We also went on and developed impact data collection uh, templates as well, which looked at you know, how assets would be impacted after a certain hazard or disaster. And so this is just um, a screenshot of the survey that was conducted obviously by Carol over there uh, and her and while she was still there. And so what we decided, you know, through this was these were the tools that would go with because it was common in most of the countries. Uh, using Cobo Toolbox to collect data, you know, QGIS, uh, so on and so forth. And also in, there were instances of um, a Juno that was deployed in about three or four countries as well. Uh, and so these were the, you know, the open source tools that we decided to actually go in and strengthen capacity around. And then COVID-19 hit the pandemic, you know, and all of a sudden, picography was at the back of everyone's mind, you know, like it was the last thing people wanted to think about. You know, we were building up conversations with stakeholders and then this hit and all of a sudden, nobody wanted to talk with us, you know? I mean, uh, projects that were uh, during that time, this is probably the same thing that you experienced, you know, and all of a sudden, we were more worried about our favorite pastime activity being blamed for the spread of COVID in Fiji. You know, uh, so this were, I mean, some of the, uh, it definitely um, built a lot of resilience in the way we approached our project as well. A lot of things had to be uh, done differently virtually, uh, whether it be training or conversations, but there wasn't the same res reception that we'd get in the Pacific Island countries. Eh? Um, if you're from, I mean, if you work with them, you know that face-to-face -face works better than virtual. Eh? And so if you're talking, you can be saying something on the screen, but you know, it means a lot more when you're sitting in front of them, having a drink, 
uh, and you know you actually get a lot more out of it. Uh, so this was quite a challenging time for us. It definitely threw everything up in the air, uh, and it definitely brought our time period to implement our data collection from two years down to about seven months. You know, after the pandemic faded away and borders finally opened. Yes, you know, there were ways to remotely collect data, uh, but we really wanted to be in country to, you know, actually build that capacity because we under understood the context, you know, in the Pacific Island countries and how important it would be to be there on the ground. Uh, and so, alas, we had to continue our project. You know, whilst we were working online in our homes, which we were fortunate to do in the Pacific Island countries, um, we worked on um, actually taking these standardized data collection templates and implementing them on Kobo toolbox and also taking a stock take of the available exposure data uh, within um, the five or so countries. Uh, this is just screenshots of you know what we developed. You know, we it was on Kobo toolbox. We worked on um, standardized templates. We also developed manuals, about four different manuals of how to Set up your tool, how set up your device, how to use Kobo, um, the definitions of the different attributes, different assets, so on and so forth. Uh, and because we knew, I mean, out of conversations that uh, something that really lacked within countries as well was the documentation of, you know, some of the methodologies. And it, it adds on to the sustainability of some of the things that you bring into country. Yeah? Documentation is very key, particularly in the Pacific Island countries. As mentioned by Carol, you know, um, we're very thankful uh, to, the, to some of these open source um, sources, you know, that we actually pulled some of the data to prepare us for the exposure data collection. So we pulled from OSM, which, you know, had, yes, limited attribution, but it was great to pull some of the building footprints from there, also utilities from roads, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, also from PACRIS. Um, and also from Pacific Data Hub that some of us that are familiar with as well. Obviously, we would have loved to get data from the countries themselves because there's, you know, there's a lot of data there, but as mentioned by some of my colleagues, you know, it takes months to get some of this data, eh? uh, and particularly coming out of COVID, you know, that was the last thing that people wanted to do is give you data. Eh? Uh, they're, gonna, they're probably they're gonna do asking us more on how you're going to help us through COVID. Eh? It's the last question that they wanted to answer during that particular time. So we had to make do with um, some of the open source, I mean, yeah, open source, uh, some of the open data sources. And also, I mean, there were quite a lot of data gaps or areas that weren't covered according to where countries wanted data to be collected. Uh, and so we ended up digitizing most of uh, these areas. Uh, and this is the great thing about it was that there were communities already present in some of the countries, and I'm grateful, you know, because in Fiji, they're very active with uh, Carol, Lani, Nehemiah, and so we, through a mapathon, we were able to, you know, actually digitize some of these uh, these areas. I think it was in the Solomons, uh, and also, um, we were also able to reach out to students in the university uh, that were enrolled in GIS, you know, bring them in uh, to also help digitize. So it was also not only, um, preparation for the data collection, but also building that community uh, in Fiji as well, eh? uh, in terms of open source software. So it was a great opportunity uh, for a lot of us, uh, particularly the younger age group that are coming up uh, in, uh, in Fiji as well. So yeah, digitizing, you know, we're focusing on certain areas of interest uh, in some of these countries. These are, this is, yeah, this is probably an ugly screenshot, but uh, this is literally what was happening, you know, uh, we're overlaying a number of the sources and we're looking at gaps and digitizing according to that. Eh? This is also quite messy as well. This is not really what, uh, this is what, uh, I mean, just an example, not really what we worked with. Uh, but we also created grids and also assigned building IDs uh, to each of the buildings just for reference, you know, in terms of uh, post-processing, you know, cleaning data later onwards and also for reference when you're out in the field. In some cases, countries also asked for maps uh, where, you know, particularly out in the field for reference. Uh, and so this, we created maps as well as to how, you know, to go about when they're out in the field. Uh, and we also use QField as well, um, but for the pure purpose of just tracking or uh, knowing as a guide. Eh? Uh, I'm aware though that, you know, you can also, it could have been used as a tool for data collection as well. Uh, if we had a bit of time, a bit more than seven months, you know, we would definitely would have, um, 
explore that option, but in this case, it, uh, we just use Qtool as an, an act of a guide eh, when we're out in the field, which was uh, quite handy. Uh, so people just holding tablets and they're just switching between Kobo Toolbox and Qtool, which was, yeah, it worked well with the tablet that we were using. Next, we, act, we had to go into country and actually train you know, the surveyors. We had to train some of the staff in terms of how to use the tool, how to, um, you know, the different definitions for some of the attributes. Uh, and also, our training also touched on uh, validating the data as well. Eh? So what we're trying to come into country and somewhat walk through the stakeholders with was like uh, trying to actually capture the entire package, a uh, training package. We started off with Tonga. Tonga was one of the first countries that actually kind of opened their borders. So we rocked up uh, straight after the border opened, quarantined for two weeks, and then we're out in the field. Um, we worked with a number of ministries, which I was really grateful for. It set the perfect platform, you know, to not only build capacity on data collection, but more so the use of open source tools. And so we had a, a variety of ministries, you know, that didn't, they, you know, they'd, they'd rock, they'd come to the training, you know, and they'd have, uh, some of them were just literally using paper, you know, to collect some of their data. Some of them were, you know, using some sort of paid software to actually, and so when we went through Kobo Toolbox, mindset started to change, eh? you know, they were like, oh, okay. You know, there was a certain element of awareness, like some of them didn't even know that, you know, there were open source tools available. Uh, and so we had a really good platform, you know, we had a wide uh, variety of stakeholders, which also informed how we went out and did the survey because they were experts in their different fields and they knew how particular assets, you know, how we are actually collecting that for particular assets. We went out to four different islands in uh, Tonga, so we hit the capital, Tongatapu, Nukualofa, uh, Ewa is Foa, which is, uh, I, I don't think, southeast of Tonga, Hapai, Pangai, and Foa. And also uh, one of the big islands, Vavau, Neaku. Eh? So we did quite a bit of work. It was quite tiring going to houses, you know, collecting different assets, rocking up with your mask, and there's a lady from inside, she's looking at you and she's like, you know, shaking her head because COVID was just out. And so there was a lot of challenges. There were a lot of dogs. You'll be surprised the number of dogs they have in Tonga. Uh, and so um, we definitely, we were holding a tablet in one hand, holding a stick in the other hand. Uh, so you're walking, you're hitting, and I would try to take the GPS point. And so it was definitely an interesting experience. Um, Tonga was, yeah, baptism of fire for some of us, you know, running away from dogs and whatnot. So, um, that's what we literally did in Tonga, but it was, once again, it was definitely an eye-opener for a lot of the ministry staff, you know, in terms of some of the tools that made, you know, some of their work easier as well, eh? And yeah, yeah. Vanuatu. We didn't have as much, um, how to say, participation from the different ministries, but the unique thing about Vanuatu was that we were able to engage some of the staff at the sub-national level as well, so at provincial council level which was great as well. I mean, that just brought us closer to the community. And uh, as mentioned by Carol, mentioned by, I think by John as well, it's sometimes very hard to get access to some, you know, some of these communities, unless you have a local face, a familiar face. And so when we had, you know, this provincial level stuff, it was literally like we were one of them. Eh? And so we just walked into the community, it was pretty easy to collect data. And so that was the great thing about Vanuatu. They were also one of the, uh, maybe the only country that actually um, took the training and institutionalized it in some of their ministries. Uh, and so now some of them are actually using Kobo Toolbox, like it's actually part of their ministry workflow, you know, using an open source tool and also QGIS. And I'll talk about this later, but, you know, just as an opener to Vanuatu, very resilient, you know, in terms of the ministries that, uh, and some of the staff that are available there as well. <coughs> Sorry, it's not quite clear here, but it's probably clear up there. Um, so we, the two main townships that we focused on was Lanakel and also Lakatoro. Um, the reason being is because the government of Vanuatu, you know, there, there's been a huge push uh, towards building resilient townships. And uh, uh, some of you might know, Vanuatu is one of the most at-risk countries at the moment, uh, also with Tonga. Eh? 
Uh, and so um, a lot of, uh, in the Pacific, a lot of the, um, <coughs> a lot of the communities around the coast, and so, you know, we, we get affected or impacted a lot by hazard. And so we work, uh, we collected exposure data in these two countries, and it was an initiative that was, um, we, we worked, we collaborated together with another project called the PrEP project, um, which is also implemented under SPC. Um, and so we went out and collected data in these two townships, and they later on developed, used the data to develop, you know, somewhat of a town planning, uh, you know, to inform decisions on how to plan the town in so and so years, yeah, according to the risk that, uh, so it was, it was great for, you know, to be part of that as well. Vanuatu also went on and uh, wanted to collect exposure that for Port Vila. And so Port Vila is definitely, a, you know, a huge uh, area, you know, like uh, it's, there's a lot more informal settlements in Port Vila. Uh, and so what we had to do was we had to widen our group of surveys. So what the ministry staff thought about was like, okay, how about we approach some of the graduates from the universities that have graduated but don't have any jobs, yeah? Let's just train them, you know, how to use some of these tools, and then let's go out and survey. And so we brought about 35, 40 students that had graduated, had no jobs, had base knowledge, you know, about how to collect data and whatnot. Uh, and so we, we trained them, but SPC didn't train them. It was trained by the ministry staff in Bisalama, in their local language which was great, you know, it, they understood a lot of this a lot easier when they used the local, uh, local language. And so when we rocked up and collected data in, in Port Vila, it was local faces going out, you know, that understood, that were trained in the local language, that were using open source tools, so on and so forth. And so we went out, collected data in Port Vila, and they took initiative and went out to Sola as well, which is another island up north in Vanua Lava. Um, and ongoing right now, I'm actually supposed to be in, uh, in Sento, in Vanuatu right now, in Luganville. There's actually data collection happening there right now. Right now, there's actually a team collecting data at the moment. And I just wanted to give a, a screenshot of data that's been collected as of yesterday in, um, in Luganville at the moment. Yeah? And it's the same group of graduates that were trained, you know, 30 plus or so that have gone out. And so there's been definitely initiatives taken, you know, to contextualize the training that we bring in and also pass that on you know, to more to the community level groups. Eh? And this is them actually yesterday, you know, they're going to some of the grids uh, and collecting data. As you can see, you know, uh, there's not much attention to OHS or not, you know, you're just wearing jandals, a jacket, highlighter jacket, and you're out there eh, to collect data. Uh, but so that's happening right now in Luganville, uh, in Santo, um, and it's definitely been uh, in Vanuatu, a process of, you know, um, not only being aware of the need, but connecting to that need as well. Eh? Solomons, um, we had quite an involvement from the ministries, and we also went out to a number of islands in the Solomons as well. Um, Honiara, East and West, Gu Guadalcanal, Temotu, Makira. And these are some of the, uh, so Solomon's at that time was really, really hot. And it was quite challenging uh, going out collecting data in the Solomon's. But this is just to give a scope of, uh, I mean, what we went out and did in countries. Eh? And Savo. I think I'm, uh, my time is catching up on me, so I'm going to skip a bit through some of this. Uh, we went through uh, also Samoa. We had quite a lot of stakeholders involved in Samoa as well which is great. Samoa was more, or was, I think, uh, some of you might ag agree, Samoa was one of the more experienced uh, in terms of technical work. And so they had quite a number of uh, staff, you know, that had, um, that were we well versed, you know, with uh, some of these tools as well. And they had their preferred uh, tools that they wanted to use as well, which was great. It gave us another great platform uh, to talk and uh, also advocate on some of the uses of um, open source tools. Eh? In Samoa, we only covered Apia Upolu and some of the districts um, in Apia. Uh, and this was literally uh, the area that we covered. Cook Islands was probably one of the more challenging countries, particularly because they are as heavy. Eh? 
uh, I don't know why, maybe it's the connection between New Zealand or something like that, or, uh, but Cook Islands was literally, you know, one of the, they were the first country we talked with, but they were the last country we implemented with. <laughs> because it took so much time, you know, trying to um, talk through, you know, like they were just like, nah, ak, survey one, two, three, no, it's not happening. We're not gonna, there's no way we're gonna use some of those tools. Uh, you know, and we were, we were working with people that had been in the ministry for 20, 25 years, 30 years. And so there was definitely a comfort, you know. You know, they were, they were, they were set with just using those tools. Eh? Uh, and it, you'll see this in some of the Pacific Island countries, you know, it's just, this is it. This is what we're going to use. Eh? Regardless of how much it's going to cost, what not, uh, you know, this is what we're going to use. You're not going to come in and tell us that there's a, you know, a free one and easier one to use. But, uh, <coughs> so that's what we faced in Cook Islands. We're working with the emergency, emergency management Cook Islands as our focal point. Um, but eventually, you know, they opened up, said, okay, we'll try Kobo Toolbox. Uh, we'll try QGIS as well in terms of visualizing the data. Uh, and so it was definitely a breakthrough in terms of, uh, we, we mapped out Rarotonga one of the <coughs> and also Aitutaki, which was where majority of the population in Cook Islands uh, is located as well. Eh? <coughs> There's also plans uh, to map three other islands which they would like to do in December. And so through that, they'd like to also build capacity, you know, with some of the other ministries in Cook Islands using open source tools. Obviously, you know, there has to be uh, validation and also data cleaning. I'll probably skip through this because my time is telling me that I should. Um, so we used, I mean, there were different layers of validating, you know, obviously on Kobo, there's a surface uh, aspect of it. And we used a lot of the locals to validate the data because they are a bit more aware. So we particularly singled out, you know, uh, team leaders or people that were a bit senior in, uh, in their knowledge. Uh, and so they did validation and we handled the back end of it in SPC. But we also documented this. And so uh, we went through training with um, the staff as well, eh? with the ministry staff. So just that they are aware of how, you know, you can clean data as well. And then we uploaded um, onto PACRIS. So the idea before this was that, uh, like I said, there were multiple instances of geonodes, you know, in, uh, in some of the countries. So the idea was for countries to upload into their geonode and then it would feed into a regional level geonode, which was uh, Pacific Risk Information System. Eh? Uh, that wasn't the case. It eventually just went all to uh, PACRIS, you know, after a lot of conversation with the countries. Uh, and so I'll just show a few screenshots of the data that's uploaded there. It's open. If you want to visit it, you know, it's at risk.spc.int. Uh, if you wanted to look at some of these country data sets, um, I think all the countries have uploaded their data into it except for Cook Islands, uh, which we're still trying to um, work our way around. Yeah. <coughs> These are some photos of yeah, the, um, the surveyors out in the field um, in Vanuatu and also here in Samoa. Lastly, after collecting all the, all the data, you know, it's only fair that we strengthen also the capacity on how to analyze some of this data and also use some of the data, which was through what we decided or what we had talked through was QGIS. Eh? We we're going to uh, introduce or strengthen the capacity around the usage of QGIS. And this, by this time, a lot of the stakeholders that we're working with, their mindsets were starting to change. You know, like, oh, hang on. I can actually use this through, you know, multiple things in my ministry, you know? You know, like I can, this is actually a very useful, uh, you know, at first it started off as, okay, let's do this, they're giving money, you know, let's just carry out the exposure data collection and whatnot. But as we went on to actually do uh, training using QGIS, mindset started to change. They were like, okay, I can actually use this in some of the work that I'm doing in my ministry. I can actually teach this, you know, to so-and-so staff in my, uh, department or whatnot, eh? and the best thing about it was, you know, I don't have to spend a lot of money. I didn't have to spend any money, in fact, you know, and so mindset started to change by the time we were hitting um, the GIS or, G um, the, I mean, fundamentals on GIS through QGIS. Eh? Uh, we, we intentionally allocated two to three days in our training where we sat down with participants 
and literally just asked him, okay, this is what you've learned. What do you do in your work, you know, where some of this can be used? It literally had to be that, you know, we had to sit down and talk through. Uh, it, it, you know, it, yeah, it was uh, at times you could spend, sit down hours sitting with a particular ministry and ask him, oh, okay, so, you know, trying to get out what they actually want. And so it, it was, uh, it used up a lot of time, but it was definitely worth it. You know, coming out of that training with them sitting down, spending time, and this is what I think you would have to do in Pacific Island countries. Sit down, connect to the need that they have, and using, you know, the tools or the knowledge of things that you, you know, that you have within you, try to connect to that need. Eh? Uh, and in the Pacific Island countries, it goes a long way. You know, if you're able to sit down with them and talk with some of this ministry stuff, that relationship lasts over, you can count so many or so years, eh? it will last. In the Pacific Island countries, relationship goes a long way. It goes a really long way. And so that's what we did. Uh, and out of this, you know, uh, I can see there, there are a number of examples. In the Ministry of Ag Agriculture in Tonga, just two months ago, they were running their own GIS training. You know, one of the girls that participated in, the, in, our, um, in our training, she went out, she went and talked to a CEO. She was like, hey, you know, there's this QGIS, you know, it makes a, lo a lot of our work easier. Can I run the training with all the other um, district staff in the other islands? You know, I want them to know how to use some of these tools, how to actually analyze. So it, it just kind of trickled out because, you know, there was a certain time allocated, you know, to actually listen. What's the need? How do we answer that need? Eh? Uh, likewise, in Vanuatu, with the Department of Urban Affairs and Planning, you know, they, they went out and actually contextualized much of the training around Kobo Toolbox. They turned all the training into Bislama and now they're teaching. I mean, they're going around actually training staff in different ministries, you know? So it, the great thing about using open source tools, I think is, or I mean, in the Pacific context is once they understand, you know, how, how useful it is, how easy it is to use, you know, it, it, it just takes, care of, uh, um, takes a lot of care of itself. Eh? I'm going over time here, uh, but I think I'll just skip through. I put experience rather than challenges because, you know, definitely um, the challenges add to, you know, what you experience. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Um, some of the things that we face, you know, the usual competition with paid software, you know, there were a lot of, a number of countries that are saying, hey, nah, man, like we, in Cook Islands, they actually, you know, the great thing about Cook Islands, they, the government has actually allocated funding you know, for ESRI, you know, they recognize the importance of the use of uh, um, some of these tools and so they allocated funding. I went, I was in Cook Islands just two weeks ago. Um, we ran a QGIS training with Cook Islands. And after that, the, uh, one of the lead uh, geospatial managers in uh, ICI, Infrastructure Cook Islands, he came up to me and he was like, man, this is really good. I mean, I, I like uh, QGIS. It's actually pretty easy to use and I'm definitely, and after that he told me, you know, the government of Cook Islands actually has uh, paid for licenses for about 100 users for ministry staff for over three years, for the next three years. And like, he couldn't, you know, he was trying to, there was definitely a battle in his mind, you know, because government had uh, definitely, you know, allocated funds for it. And so that's the context in Cook Islands, you know, they have money. And then I asked, okay, after three years, who is the, who's gonna, do you think government is still gonna have that money? He was like, I'm not too sure, you know. Uh, so, in some countries, they do allocate funding, uh, but it's just, yeah, uh, I think we really have to work on this awareness of some of the tools that we take into Pacific Island countries. <coughs> yep, the reception, you know, the stigma that was attached to, when they heard free, they was like, oh, it must be chick line, or that must be, you know, probably isn't accurate, you know, <laughs> it's, I mean, it might be funny, but this is what the mindset is in some of the Pacific Island countries, you know, the stigma that's connected to it. They think if it's paid, it's much better. Uh, if it's free, then obviously it's just one of those, you know, easy to, I mean, one of those surface tools. Um, yeah, when we're using QGIS, there was a bit, you know, a few bugs that we had to, I mean, we really hit a couple of times when we were doing trainings with, uh, and that didn't help the drive in some instances, uh, particularly with some of the new users of GIS. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders would uh, really uh, know more about this, you know, that we like to be in the comfortable. 
Uh, and so a lot of the times are comfortable with, you know, just some of the paid software that we use. This is, I think, another key point uh, that I, it's more at the regional level and just the coordination between partners or different organizations going into countries. There's quite a number of portals or different tools that are being introduced in countries, uh, specifically in the Pacific Island countries. And at times it's quite confusing for some of them, you know, like they'll meet someone from SPC who's talking about this tool and then someone from where? Um, the UN. UND, <laughs> UNDP would come in and say, hey, this is a great tool for you to use so and so. And then another one from another FAO or something would come in and hey, this. So there definitely has to be better coordination in terms of going to the country and the different thematic areas that we um, actually inform. Eh? Oh, okay. Cooperation, yeah, there's definitely a lot of silos within the ministries, uh, like Carol mentioned. In a lot of our training sessions, we had a person, you know, we had different ministries there. This person was in need of this person's data. They were literally just five meters apart. And then we'd go talk to him. He's like, yeah, I really need, you know, this data to finish some of my work. He's like, but it's with that person. And then we'd go, the other person would say the same thing, yeah? Uh, and, but there's a lot of politics to that, you know, because they have to obviously go through the hierarchy and talk. And like Carol said, five, six months uh, talks, you know, then you actually can share some of that data. There are... Uh, Carol mentioned that the, you know, there are two countries so far that have you know, an actual framework in place where sharing can be done. There's also a number of countries that have drafts that have been drafts for a number of years uh, and has, haven't moved, uh, but you know, hopefully we can actually um, set that framework right. Um, there were also a lot of past experiences you know, where countries came in, I mean, projects came in and didn't actually um, give full authority to some of these data sets. And so Anything to do with geospatial, you know, there's a lot, there's a pullback uh, on some of the, you know, some of the work if you're coming to collect data or whichever tool that you're using, they're very sensitive in some of these countries. Eh? And lastly, yeah, definitely a framework that has to be in place eh, in order for some of uh, our work to be a bit easier. Opportunities, obviously, then, I mean, the appetite is there in the Pacific Island countries, but there just has to be an intention to the awareness of some of these tools. Capacity building for us, you know, under pictography, you know, it was trying to contextualize some of this that to be a bit closer to some of the countries in terms of what they need. Uh, it couldn't be too generic uh, in terms of what we brought into the country. Eh? Um, and also, I think Harry had touched a, a bit on this was just approaching with intent, you know, in some of these countries, you know. Uh, um, in the Pacific Islands, you know, they, there is a higher level of awareness uh, in terms of what they would like or what they need. And so we just have to be really intentional with what we go into countries with. Eh? And like I said, knowing the need and connecting to that need. Lastly, and I think Natasha had touched a bit of about this, was just introducing a sustainable, relevant, convenient workflow. And what we, what we brought into some of these countries was we tried to simplify it as much as possible. So it could be something that could be, you know, carried on from the national level down to the sub-national level. Eh? Um, and that was the whole intent behind what we took in. Uh, there, were, there are a number of um, upcoming initiatives, you know, if you're asking about sustainability of some of the things that we've done. Uh, so through the partner project, we've gone in and done refresher trainings on QGIS. We started with Cook Islands uh, last week and we are, and I think we did uh, Tonga as well. Uh, next year, we're going into, uh, I think, three more countries as well, you know, to do a refresher on QGIS with somewhat the same, you know, group of stakeholders. Eh? And also, I, I mean, there are a number of countries that wanted to get a coverage of all the islands as well. And so we went out, wrote proposals. There's funding available, so we went out, wrote proposals. We got funding for a number of these countries as well. Vinakavakalevu, eh? I'm sorry I went over time. Uh, but a uh, huge thank you again to, um, you know, the team here and also to the pictography team that's in uh, SPC as well. Um, <coughs> yeah, I went over time, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, if there are any. Zoom in the middle. <coughs> Thanks, Hamish. Um, 
Uh, firstly, your stakeholder, uh, your stakeholder engagement just seems amazing. It just seems next level, like what you've managed to achieve. Mm. Um, and the amount of work that you've done also, it just seems uh, incredible over the, over the amount of time. Mm. Um, and I'm sort of wondering how big is the group that's, that's doing all that? And are you engaging like all the way from ministries right down to local communities as well? Thanks. Um, it definitely was a lot of work. I mean, uh, the team, uh, Pico Q team, I mean, there was uh, about uh, five of us. We were five. There were five of us. So we were, you could imagine, we were spending about, I think, tops a day or two in Fiji. Like, we'd come back, day or two, fly out. Another we'd spend two weeks, day or two, out again. And so there'd be a team going in to do the exposure data collection training, and then another team going in to do the survey. And so we were just following each other into uh, different countries within a span of seven months. And so in between that as well, we, you know, you were trying to validate the data uh, and also trying to prepare for the GIS training that would follow up after that. Uh, so it was definitely a lot of work. We spent a lot of time away from our families. Um, but yeah, there were five of us. We brought in uh, two extra interns, but mostly to help with the data cleaning. Um, so there's about yeah, seven of us, yeah. Uh, one of them was just there for comms. So just taking video, so that's about six of us. <laughs> uh, he was having a free ride there. Uh, no, I mean, no, 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 he was really helpful, very technical uh, minded, but there were about seven of us. And so we, are, we were working, uh, we started off at the director or CEO level, you know, talking with them, then we went down to more the technical stuff, which we implemented some of the work with. And like I said, with some of the countries, we actually went down to uh, the sub-national level and actually worked with some of the communities there. So it, it was, uh, yeah, definitely a great experience. I learned a lot about different countries and whatnot. And so it, for me, it really um, brought a lot of meaning to the why I do this work here. Um, just from the top all the way down to the bottom and um, talking with the community, seeing um, how exposed they are to some of the risk or some of these hazards, you know, whether it's inundation or whatnot. It definitely brought a lot of meaning to, and also to the ministry staff that we are working with. Because you know, a lot of times it just becomes somewhat of a routine for some of them. But taking them out to the field, seeing where some of these families are actually staying at, you know, and how their work actually informs those families, it definitely brought a lot of meaning to why we're doing it. Yeah. Thank you, Arisi. And, um, uh, and please join me in, um, in thanking um, Arisi for both his considerable leadership and sharing your experience.